subject that I have chosen for myself today is very dear to my heart. I want to talk to you today about the mighty apostle to the Gentiles. Paul is not a person that I started to love after I came to understand the Word of God, rightly divided. I was saved in January of 1984 in Margate, Florida, and it wasn't very long after I was saved that I began to realize that there was one person in the Word of God who knew and understood what had happened to me and was able to help me understand it and was able to explain it to me. So not long after I was saved, I was drawn to the epistles of Paul. I found Paul fascinating, and I found that he understood my condition, and frankly, that was contrary to the church that I had been saved in. I was saved in a prosperity church. Kenneth Hagin came there, Kenneth Copeland came there, all that, okay? And they taught the prosperity message. They taught that now that I was saved, I would be blessed with health, wealth, and prosperity, and all I needed was the faith of Abraham. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that was not my experience at all, which is why I have chosen for my text this morning, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 24. Colossians 1.24, Paul said, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Just focus for a few moments on the first two words of that verse. Who now, 35 years after his Damascus Road experience, after a life of beatings with rods, being stoned, being shipwrecked, in perils of robbers, in perils of waters, in perils of the heathen, in perils of his own countrymen, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils amongst false brethren, in sufferings, in painfulness, after a life of being troubled on every side, of being perplexed and persecuted and cast down, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, after Alexander the coppersmith had done him much evil, after being slanderously reported, after suffering as an evildoer, after all they which be in Asia have forsaken me and turned away from me, and now as he writes this epistle to the church at Colossae, he's in a Roman prison, after all these things, Paul says, who now, and what is he doing? Verse 24, rejoice in my sufferings. How did he do that? How did he rejoice in his sufferings? I asked you to mark Acts, uh, put something in Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, Paul knew what his future held for him. In Acts chapter 9, verse 13, we read, Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem, and here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. The Apostle Paul, in the very beginning of his ministry, had an encounter with Jesus Christ, spent some time with Jesus Christ where he learned that his destiny was a destiny of suffering. But you'll notice in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 24 that he did not suffer for himself. Notice the verse again, Colossians 1 24, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. Paul had one compelling 
one heartfelt reason for suffering. It was for you. It was for the body of Christ. And he said, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ. When Paul speaks of the afflictions of Christ, what is he referring to? What is he talking about? I asked you to put something in Hebrews 12, right? Hebrews 12 helps us to understand something of this suffering of Jesus Christ that Paul says he filled up that which is behind of. In Hebrews chapter 12, notice verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Jesus Christ, in his earthly ministry, endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Now, there are, in, in this group of sinners, there are two groups that comprise what the writer to the Hebrews is talking about of these, of these sinners. The first group is the world. Now, for the sake of brevity, I'm going to run through several verses. If you couldn't follow Brian Ross yesterday, you you're not going to follow this, okay? He wanted you to listen, which was good. I would like you to just listen. I'm going to run through a few verses. But Jesus Christ said, John 15, 18, If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. Matthew 10, 22, You shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. John 15, 19, If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. So first of all, Jesus Christ was hated by the world. The second group that Jesus Christ was hated by was the religious world. In Matthew chapter 12, the religious world said he was a devil. In Matthew 21, they challenged his authority, verse 23. And when he was coming to the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? In Matthew chapter 22, they took counsel against him in verse 15. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. In Luke chapter 4, this was the first time that he spoke in the temple in Luke chapter 4, verse 16. And they were filled with wrath and wanted to kill him prematurely. In verse 28, we read, And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down dead long. In Luke chapter 5, they called him a blasphemer. Verse 21, and the scribes and Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? In Luke 14, 1, they watched him. They watched him. It says, and the Pharisees also, I'm sorry, and it came to pass as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, that they watched him. Not good. In Luke 14, 1, it came to, yeah, in Luke 16, the motivation for their hatred was made manifest. It says, and the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. Covetousness, by the way, is the motive behind corrupt religion. That's how it was then. That's how it is today. That's why the denominations reject right division. Because they know they're going to lose Malachi 3.10. <laughs> okay. So Jesus Christ was hated by the world. And he was hated by religion. Jesus Christ was hated of all men. And he endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. In Colossians 1 we read, 
that Paul filled up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ. And Paul, as you're about to see, endured such contradiction of sinners against himself to fill up that which was behind of the afflictions of Christ. Now, what kind of afflictions did Paul enter into? 2 Timothy, I asked you to put something in 2 Timothy. It's chapter 3. Notice verse 10. Paul said to Timothy, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, verse 11, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. What kind of persecutions did Paul have to endure to bring the gospel of the grace of God? What did he go through? Turn to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. And we just read about three cities in 2 Timothy. Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. And before we begin this journey with our apostle, I want to read a passage of scripture. You don't have to go there. It's Acts 26. This is where Paul stands before King Agrippa and he gives his defense. In verse 9, Paul says, I verily thought with, my, with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints that I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. Listen. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Think of those words. Exceedingly mad. Being exceedingly mad was the ordinary posture of a Pharisee. That's how they were. That's the world Paul lived in. And now he's been arrested by this one that he persecuted. And now he is going to face the wrath and the anger of those who were with him, who were exceedingly mad against this Jesus of Nazareth, this imposter. <coughs> so he's about to face the same wrath that he had demonstrated to those who followed Jesus Christ. Notice in Acts chapter 13, verse 14. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch. Antioch is the first city he mentioned in 2 Timothy. And went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. From verse 15 through 29 of this chapter, Paul rehearses Israel's history. Then from verses 30 to 37, Paul talks about the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then in verses 39 and 40, Paul makes a contrast and shows the difference between the law, what it did, and the cross, and what it accomplished. And in verse 40, uh, I'm sorry, he says that, he shows them that by him, by Christ, all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. In verse 40, there's a warning to them for rejecting the gospel of the grace of God. Notice verse 40. Beware therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold ye despisers and wonder and perish for I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. In verse 42, the Gentiles waited for the Jews to leave, and they wanted Paul to preach to them the next week. Verse 42, and when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath day. And then when that meeting was broken up, and that's the term they use, broken up, verse 43. Now, when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, 
persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. This is in the very early days of Paul's ministry. We know what Paul was preaching. He persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Don't let anyone tell you Paul wasn't preaching the gospel of the grace of God early in his ministry. Amen. There it is in Acts chapter 13. Amen. It's right there. As a matter of fact, hold your finger here and turn with me to Acts chapter 11 and let's go back even further. I want to show you something. Acts chapter 11. In verse 18, then those that were in verse 19, those that were scattered abroad upon the stoning of Stephen. Verse 21, the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Verse 22. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which is in Jerusalem. Now, you know who's in Jerusalem. And it's the twelve. Alright? And something's going on out there. And it came into their ears. So verse 22 says they sent forth Barnabas. Hey, Barnabas, go find out what's going on up there, out there. And the implication is this. When you found out, you come back and let us know, okay? That's the implication. Now think about this. What had Barnabas been involved in if he's in Jerusalem? Well, in Acts chapter 5, it's the stony, I mean, is where Ananias and Sapphira keep back part of the land. And just by sake of analogy, to make it short, you know, when God created Adam and Eve, a lot of people ask, did they have belly buttons? <laughs> and I say, of course they did, because when God created them, he said, you're done and you're done. <laughs> <laughs> So the reason I share that, the reason I share that is Ananias and Sapphira, Acts chapter 5, to give you the short version, came back part of the land, Peter said, you're dead and you're dead. Remember that? And twice in that chapter, from verses 1 to 11, twice it says, and great fear came upon all them. That's what Barnabas had seen. That's what Barnabas was involved in. And they said, Barnabas, go find out what's going on out there. And notice, notice this, okay? Verse 23. When he came, when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad. Barnabas leaves Jerusalem from the law-keeping Pharisee who had just killed a couple people, or that's what it looked like. He comes and he sees the grace of God. Does he go back? Does he go back to Jerusalem? Verse 25. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus to seek Saul. Man, I want to find, I want to go see this guy who's preaching this grace. This is beautiful. It was already happening back then, okay? So people who say that Paul wasn't preaching the gospel of the grace of God. Acts chapter 13, 43, it's already there, all right? So now we're in Antioch. Go back to Acts chapter 13. So far, everything is so good. So far, so good in Antioch. But remember, this is the first city that Paul, in 2 Timothy 3.11, told Timothy, Thou hast fully known my persecutions, which came to me at Antioch. Okay. So what persecutions and afflictions came to him at Antioch? What happened? Well, in verse 44, Acts 13, 44, and the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Man, you would think that's a great thing, right? Verse 45, but. Now, when you see, you know, we talk about the butts of Paul. Butts of Paul are great. They're going to take you from what he's been talking about. But. But now, but God, in Acts, the butts are never good. <laughs> Very rarely are the butts good in the book of Acts. Verse 45, but when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Paul is filling up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ 
who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, and it just started. They're contradicting Paul like they contradicted Jesus Christ. Keep this in mind. Keep this in mind. Because this is a principle that has continued from that day to this very day that we sit here right now. Organized religion. And when I say organized religion, I want you to understand what I will be meaning from here till I sit down. Organized religion in the world and not that you and I live in is any group or organization that claims to have some sort of affiliation to Christianity. And most of them falsely call themselves Christians. Whether it's the organizations that have hierarchies that lead up to one man who sits there with a hat that looks like this, <laughs> or whether it's the other organizations that all have one place where they answer to, and I'm including all of the independent fundamentalist churches that claim to be self-governing and have no hierarchy, so they say, but send all their children to the same Bible schools where they're indoctrinated by their denominational preferences and brainwashed according to their denominational beliefs, I'm including them too. When I talk about organized religion, I am talking about everything outside of dispensational theology. That's what I'm talking about. All right? That clear? Okay. Organized religion has always hated the gospel of the grace of God. Always. Take away works, take away obedience from the law in any form, whether it's the law of Moses, whether it's the blessings of Deuteronomy chapter 28, which your TV evangelist and radio reverence deceive their people with. Take away Malachi 3.10. Take away the four Gospels or the first chapters of the book of Acts with its cloven tongues of fire. And it's speaking in tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. And it's signs and wonders and diverse miracles. When you remove those things that religion takes from the law and brings into the body of Christ and teach that those components of the law are part of your salvation and are for your obedience, when you take those things away from them, you have an angry hornet's nest of law-keeping Pharisees exceedingly mad at you and shaking their fists at you, and they will contradict and blaspheme those words that were sp spoken by Paul. And not only do they hate the message, they hate the messenger. Amen. And if you happen to be the messenger, they will hate you too. Amen. But regardless, regardless of the opposition to the message, regardless of how hated and how much envy there was, verse 46, then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold. Hallelujah. When organized religion raises its ugly head, it's not time to cower. It's time to wax bold. And I didn't say wax arrogant. I said wax bold. Timothy, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge. Timothy, I'm committing something to you. I'm giving you something to do that you're going to be judged for. What is it, Paul? Preach the word. How did Paul and Barnabas view? How did they view what was happening? They waxed bold. That's what they did. How did the Gentiles view all this? 
verse 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad Amen. and glorified the word of the Lord. Listen, when grace preachers and grace brethren follow the pattern of their example, those listening will be glad. Amen, brother. Amen. You'll be glad. Verse 49, and the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. Regardless of the opposition, they kept preaching. Of course, organized religion is not happy with grace preachers. So what do they do? Verse 50, but, uh -huh, told you, told you, but, the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution. They raised persecution means, that means they agitated the people. They incited a riot against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. Now notice this verse, verse 50. They stirred up the, de the devout and honorable women. They stirred up those people that in their assemblies had all the trappings of religiosity. Others would look at them and look up to them and believe them because they seemed to be the people who were in the know. And they trusted them. Devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city. And what did the Jews do to these people? They infected their minds. They stirred them up into a frenzy against Paul. And I've got news for you. That's what organized religion has always done against the message of God's grace. They get certain people in their churches, men of renown, devout women, who seem to know what they're talking about. And they stir them up into a frenzy against the message of grace. They lie to them about Paul's message. And they even lie to them about Paul. And they lie to them about you. And what do they do with the messengers? Notice the last part of verse 50. They expel them out of their coasts. They not only kick them out of their city. <laughs> They expelled them out of their coasts. They brought them to the boundary or the border of their territory and expelled them out of their coasts. Do you imagine if the local organized religion where you used to attend had their way? They put you on a plane to Siberia <laughs> with a one-way ticket. If they could do that, they would. Know why? Because organized religion has always hated the gospel of the grace of God. You heard it yesterday in Brian's message. You, I mean, from the very beginning, all the way up into Europe. But how did Paul and Barnabas respond to this persecution and being expelled from their coast? Verse 51. But they shook off the dust off their feet and came to Iconium. Let me ask you this. You want to know if you're in the right church? You want to know? I'll, I'll tell you how to find out. Go up to your pastor. Say, I heard a preacher, and I agree with him now, who said that Paul is our apostle today. And that the other 12 aren't talking to us. <laughs> and he said that salvation is a free gift that you can't add any works to. And he said that when you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, that it isn't water baptism that counts. 
but that you're baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. And he said that there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And that one baptism is the one of 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit are you all baptized into one body. Amen. If, they, if they hug you and shake your hand, <laughs> you're in the right place. <laughs> if they respond like those places you used to be in, you know you were in the wrong place. Right? Says here that they shook the dust off their feet. Shaking the dust off, off your feet means you don't want any remnant on you from that law-keeping system you were in. You shake the dust. I got news for you. When you left their coasts, from wherever you were, you shook the dust off your feet. That's what happened in Antioch. All right? Next place that Paul mentioned to Timothy was Iconium, 2 Timothy 3. Iconium, that's chapter 14, verse 1. And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. But! <laughs> Not a good but. <laughs> but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Think about that made their minds evil affected. It's like they injected some venom. What, what Paul's preaching is poison. You know, that's the same thing they, that the Jews did in Antioch. They filled their minds with fear about what Paul was teaching. That's what they do today, folks. They get the deacons they get the elders together with some of the prominent people and they start to infect their minds about you. Can you believe that they, he's saying that the Gospels aren't for you today? <gasps> and, then, and then Paul is your apostle. Can you believe I mean, Jesus was baptized. That's good enough for me. He doesn't believe in water baptism today. <gasps> and then that starts to spread like a cancer throughout the whole church to a group of people who don't know their Bibles. This is how you recognize denominationalism. And all of them are happy and satisfied that there's someone standing in the front who seems to know what he's talking about. After all, he knows Greek. He's been to Bible school. He's wearing a collar. Obviously, he must be from God. And they bow down in, at that altar and worship that false... I told someone lately that if someone doesn't acknowledge Paul that doesn't acknowledge that what Paul wrote are the commandments of the Lord. Of course, they're ignorant, let them be ignorant still. And 2 Timothy 2.7, that if Paul said, consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding, and if someone doesn't consider what they say, that you need to paste this verse across their forehead when you're talking to them. And it's Job 38, verse 2. Job said, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? And I shared that with a friend of mine in Colorado. I said, I'm going to walk around with a pasty note. Put that on, on, on all these people's forehead. Because that's what's happening. Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? I'll tell you who it is. It's the people who are not rightly dividing the word of truth and obeying the only verse in the Bible that tells them how to study their Bible which is 2 Timothy 2.15. One verse tells you how to study your Bible. 
and all of Kristen Dumb and Dumber. I love that, whoever that was. Forget. Right. All of them. So, they go to Lystra. I mean, Iconium. We're still in Iconium. And then they begin to infect the minds of the people. And here's what they tell them, okay? And I know this from experience, which is why Colossians 1.24 is a great verse for me. Because I'm experiencing it, and anybody who's actively involved in sharing the word of God rightly divided is experiencing this in some measure, in some way. But they say, don't listen to that person. He will confuse you. And people who don't know their Bibles and believe that that person that's telling them that does know their Bible, they will stay away from you like the plague. You can't talk to them. You can't approach them. They won't listen to you. Right? <laughs> Not easy once their minds are evil affected, like you just read in, in Acts here. So they had trouble in Antioch, they had trouble in Iconium. In verse, in chapter 14, verse 5, they realize that there's a conspiracy to stone them. In verse 6, notice that they're aware of it and fled unto Lystra. Lystra is the third place that Paul mentioned in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And in Acts chapter 14, verse 8, there sat a certain man at Lystra. Now here Paul heals a cripple. And as you go down the chapter, in Acts chapter 14, these people think that the gods have come down to them. So in verse 14, Paul rents his clothes. Paul and Barnabas rent their clothes and walk amongst the people saying, we're not gods. We're just like you. While this is happening, okay, while this is happening, remember the other two places they went? Antioch and Iconium? Well, it seems that the people of those cities are not just happy that they've expelled Paul and Barnabas out of their coast. They've given this some thought. <laughs> Wait a minute. We just expelled them. They're not even happy. They're alive. So what do they do? Verse 19. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people, they're good at this, by the way, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Now, you have to think about this, okay? You, you have to think about what just happened here. Here is this crowd of people who come from Antioch to Iconium and then to Lystra. Listen, from Antioch to Iconium is 83 miles. From Iconium to Lystra is 25 miles. That's 108 miles that this gang of violent, ferocious, Jew, ferocious Jews are walking, thinking about Paul. <laughs> and they want to kill him. We expelled him. Let's go kill him. You got to think about that. Think of the hatred. When these Jews, and what happened? They left Antioch, they came down to Iconium and gathered a whole group there, and then they go to Lystra. I mean, there's a mob of them. <clears throat> and they're mad. And then when they arrive at Lystra, the verse says in verse 19, they persuaded the people. I mean, imagine the uproar that they created against Paul. These people are good at this. Okay? This is the same crowd who in Antioch raised up persecution. They knew how to incite a riot. They knew how to work people up. And they did it in Lystra to the point where they convinced the people of Lystra to stone Paul, draw him out of the city, and leave him for dead. Can you imagine the hatred against the gospel of grace that would compel and motivate people to go forth 
to kill someone. Do you realize that the people who hate the gospel of the grace of God today, if it were legal, they would kill you. That's right. They would kill you. Thanks for the great message and encouragement, Rodney. <laughs> Hey, they tried to kill Paul more than once. Amen. But did they kill him? Verse 20, Acts 14, 20. How be it? As the disciples stood round about him, he rose up, came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. He rose up. But you know, no wonder he tells Timothy, thou hast fully known what persecutions and afflictions I endured at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. You would think after all this that Paul would want to stay away from those cities. Right? I mean, come on. Verse 21. When they had preached the gospel to that city, that's Derby, and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. Amen. That, brethren, is your pattern. You might say to yourself, well, why did he do that? What would compel him to do that? In Acts chapter 20, when Paul is talking to the elders at Ephesus, it says in verse 22, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Paul knows. He says, and none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto me. Paul did not count his life dear unto himself, but there's a reason why he was able to say that. Because this man had entered and was filling up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in his flesh for the body's sake, which is the church. That's the reason. The things that Paul endured that we just looked at in these three cities continued throughout his entire life. I'm not going to go through the whole book of Acts, but I want to just point out a couple more quick things, just a glance, Acts 17. In Acts chapter 17, verse 1, Paul's in Thessalonica. In verse 2, as his manner was, he went into the synagogue. He preaches, and some of the people believe. In verse 5, but, <laughs> but the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. Let me ask you something. You ever think about these lewd fellows of the baser sort? <laughs> <laughs> Looks to me like the Jews borrowed somebody from the Italian band. <laughs> hey, Guido. You own kneecaps incorporated, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I got a guy here we're having some problem with. You got a few thugs? Like some lewd fellows of the baser sort? <laughs> oh yeah, I got them. You want them to bring some cement? <laughs> nah, nah, bring some rocks. Big ones. <laughs> Ever think of those lewd fellows of the baser sort? Man. <laughs> they gotta be some scary guys you know <laughs> anyway in verse 10 they leave Paul and Barnabas leave they go to Berea and of course in verse 11 the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of heart and searched the scriptures daily to see whether those things are, were so Verse 12, therefore many of them believed. Verse 13, but 
But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. Listen, from Thessalonica to Berea, it's 43 miles. These people are going out of their way to get rid of this man who we call the apostle to the Gentiles. You can go through the entirety of the book of Acts and follow this theme. Okay? You see this happening everywhere. The book of Acts has been called many things. It's called the Acts of the, of the Holy Spirit. It's called the Acts of the Apostle. It's called the book between. It's called a transitional, not doctrinal. It's called the historical book. It's the book that bridges law and grace. It's the transitional book that brings us from law to grace. All those, in a sense, are true. But I submit to you that this book is something else. It's an account of how Paul filled up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ. What he would call in Philippians chapter 3, the fellowship of his suffering. <coughs> the book of Acts is also that. When Jesus Christ endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, Paul also endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2, and let me ask you this. Did you think you were going to escape the same fate as Paul? Because if you did, sorry. Only one way you'll escape that. Go back where you came from. That's the only way. 2 Timothy 1.18, Paul says, Timothy, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Timothy, be thou partaker of the gospel. You can put your name there. Rodney. Edward. David, Ken, Ken, Rita, be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. No matter where you came out of or what you came out of, when you, when you found the word of God rightly divided and you began to love it, there is someone or there is a group of them who disagreed with you and hated what you began to preach. They even started hating you because of it. For no other reason than that you believe the gospel of the grace of God and that Paul was your apostle. And that when you trusted Jesus Christ to save you, that moment, you were baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. And they don't understand where you're coming from, and so they hate you. Every church has that someone who takes it upon themselves to slander you and lie about you and misrepresent what you teach. Every church has that. Welcome to the afflictions of the gospel. It's no wonder that Paul in 2 Timothy 2, verse 1, 2 Timothy 2, 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. When you obey verse 2, and you're teaching people, and you're introducing them to the word of God rightly divided, and you're introducing them to the gospel of grace, 
You will receive flack. You will be hated. You will be lied about. And what are you supposed to do when that happens? Verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. What do you do? You endure it. You endure it like Jesus Christ did. You endure it like Paul did. I love the way Paul ended Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand! Stand! You will stand. You will endure. Because your reward is not in this life. Your reward is at the end of your journey. Amazing thing about Paul, I'm closing with this. Amazing thing about Paul. He tells Timothy to be a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. In the full knowledge of knowing, he's about to go to his execution. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. He's about to go to his execution for preaching the gospel that he's telling Timothy to be a partaker of the afflictions of. Notice verse 6, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. Listen, it is a fight. It is a fight. But it's a good one. I have finished my course. Verse 6, I am ready to be offered. The time of my departure, Timothy, is at hand. But don't worry about me, Timothy. Verse 8, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. Not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. What's he saying? Timothy, very soon. They're going to lay my neck down on a chopping block. And they're going to bring an axe down on my neck. And when it rolls on the floor, Jesus Christ himself is going to pick it up. And he's going to put a crown of righteousness on it, Timothy. That's why you're going to endure the afflictions of the gospel. Because your reward is at the end of your journey. Today, we're soldiers. Tomorrow, in the future. We're victors. Today, we're partakers in the afflictions of the gospel. Today, we endure hardness as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Today, with Paul, we fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ. Who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself? We do the same things. Amen.